Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Uh, I'd like to continue today on the concept of the motional EMF. Uh, and uh, remember the underlying concept, which is Faraday's law. So according to Faraday's law, whenever you have a loop, existing or virtual, that intercepts time-varying magnetic flux, So that time varying magnetic flux may be coming from a magnet that is moving or by a circuit that generates magnetic flux in a time varying way. Uh, for example, a solenoid that is fed by a time varying current, a sinusoidal current. Then you have an electromotive force. And what that means is that the electrons in this circuit, if there is a circuit and not a virtual loop, if there is an actual circuit, then the electrons will be uh, experiencing a force that will create a current. And that force acts as a virtual source that you can add to the loop. And again, if it was a positive um, voltage source, it would drive the current in the direction that you are tracing the loop. So you are free to choose which direction you want uh, to trace the loop. Once you have DL, then from this right hand rule that I have drawn there, right hand traces the loop, right hand thumb shows the direction of positive uh, flux, uh, then you have um, basically this electromotive uh, force. Uh, so obviously this can come from various ways. You may have a circuit that intercepts a time varying flux, or you may have a circuit that is moving, as I will try to show here, although the, my voltmeter, my projector is not uh, focusing this very well, but you may see the needle moving, that uh, if I actually take this loop and I move it through the magnet, you see that the needle in the voltmeter, I hope you can see it, is actually moving. And that means that although I'm having here a perfect short circuit, which is a loop and this voltmeter, I am able through this motion through the magnet to induce a current. And that is a very powerful effect that uh, is uh, described by uh, Faraday's law. So here I use the constant magnet uh, with a constant magnetic field, not a time varying magnetic field, and was able still to uh, induce a current. So this is what we call motional EMF. is when this area that intercepts the flux is changing with time. So last time we had seen, and I'd like to dig a little bit more into uh, this example of the moving rod in a constant magnetic field. So this is uh, the example. Uh, we have uh, here a circuit, let there be a resistor R. And uh, just to define a coordinate system for the overall effect, x and y, the height here of the circuit is h. And there is a moving rod with constant velocity v. Within a time varying magnetic field, uh, sorry, within a constant magnetic field and let that magnetic field be in the z direction. So it comes out of the board. Remember this uh, notation that we encounter time and again in magnetism. The dot means that the magnetic field lines are coming out of the board. Again, imagine that you have an arrow like this. Okay, When it's coming towards you, you see the front of the arrow, you see a dot. When it goes into the board, you see the x that is at the back. So this means into the board, and this means out of the board, or the paper. So this notation comes up uh, time and again. Uh, make sure you don't get it confused. So 
we show that uh, in this case that we have this moving rod inside this magnetic field, which otherwise I consider constant, because of the motion here, the area of this circuit that intercepts magnetic flux constantly changes. And in fact, uh, you see that uh, the magnetic flux through this uh, circuit, let me call it uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, and let's apply um, Faraday's law by tracing the loop in the counterclockwise sense. That means that our positive sense of flux, magnetic flux, is coming out of the board. So our ds is in the dz direction. And also this means that the electromotive force that we will calculate will act as a virtual source that again, if it was positive, it would drive a current in the direction that we are tracing the loop, which is the counterclockwise direction. So then we have uh, basically the B being constant, B not Z, and then uh, DS also pointing in the Z direction, DX, DY, because this is the area that intercepts the magnetic flux. And you see that it's constantly changing because of the motion of the rod. So Z dash Z is equal to 1. And we have B naught times the area dx dy. And that is B naught times x of t times h. So we have this time varying magnetic flux, which means that Faraday's law says there will be an EMF. That EMF is found by taking the derivative of uh, the flux with a minus sign. So that will be minus B naught H. The only thing that changes here is the length due to the motion. Dx over dt is the velocity, the constant velocity of the rod. And that is minus B naught H V naught. So basically, there will be a current and in fact, the minus sign tells us that the actual current will flow in the opposite direction that we have assumed. So there is no need really to uh, try to guess ahead of time the direction of the current. You just make the assumption and then the sign tells you which will be the actual direction of the current. So the actual uh, current flows uh, not counterclockwise, but clockwise. So the actual current flow will be in the opposite direction. OK, so this is uh, what we had seen in uh, the previous lecture. So we can uh, dig in a little bit more now. Let me. Erase here this great art. OK, or any questions up to this point? This is what we had covered before. Yes, please. You said the actual current flow is clockwise, so this is the opposite to the assumption? Yes. Okay. Yes, because you see that my result has a minus sign. Mm -hmm. So therefore, since I get this minus sign, this is what the minus sign means is that the current flows opposite the actual current flow takes place in the opposite way that I have assumed. That's the meaning of the sign. So that's why you don't have to worry ahead of time about where the current flows. The, the uh, derivations will show anyway where the current flows. You see that the uh, flow of the current is actually consistent with Lenz's law. That is, as the um, rod moves to the right, the magnetic flux always increases, always increases. So the change in magnetic flux is also monotonically increasing. That means that the induced current has now to oppose that change in the magnetic flux. How will it oppose it? It will oppose it by 
inducing itself a magnetic field that is against the outside field. And indeed, it flows in this direction so that the loop itself produces a field that opposes the external field. So we could have guessed from Lenz's law already that this would be the direction of the current. So that induces now a magnetic, produces a magnetic field that is opposite to the external. So this is consistent with Lenz's law. Now, what happens here? Uh, and why do we have physically an electromotive force? This explanation will give us an alternative way, a second way to calculate this electromotive force. Uh, so if we look at the rod itself, the rod is a conductor. So inside this conductor, there are electrons. Let's look at one particular electron here. Uh, the motion takes place inside this magnetic field, which is uniform. So what happens when I have a charge that moves with velocity v? Here, this velocity is v naught x hat inside a magnetic field. So anybody remembers moving charge inside the magnetic field? QV cross V. That's right. So it will receive a, a force from the magnetic field. So that force will be <coughs> QV cross B. We can, in fact, here precisely calculate this force. So the charge is the electron charge. It's a negative charge. The velocity is V naught x hat. And the magnetic field is B naught z hat. X cross z is minus y. With a minus sign will give you plus y. So this electron is actually experiencing a force that pushes it upwards. So then the rod, because of these forces, so as the rod moves inside the uh, magnetic field, electrons will be pushed upwards. And then eventually, we will see an excess of electrons at the top of the rod and a deficit of electrons at the bottom of the rod. So the rod eventually acts as a source that will have as a battery because of this effect that will have its top electrode, its negative electrode on the top and the positive electrode on the bottom. And that is the physical meaning why we see here a current that actually flows in this clockwise direction. So you see the force inside due to the magnetic, inside the rod applied to the electrons of the rod due to the magnetic field as the rod moves 
is the physical meaning why we're observing this electromotive force and what underpins here uh, the Faraday effect on the rod. And if we think a little bit further, this EMF that is produced by an electric field, so it is uh, the closed path integral of the electric field, can be interpreted as follows. To an observer that is moving with the rod, the rod appears to be stationary, right? So that is the, the if I'm moving with the rod, the um, motion, the rod appears to be stationary in front of me. So if I'm moving with the same velocity, V0. Then I see the force that is applied to the electrons because physics says that no matter which uh, coordinate system, which, which reference system you choose to measure forces, you will find exactly the same result. So therefore, I will see that same force being applied to the rod. And so for a moving observer, let me uh, put everything together before we get to the conclusion. Rod appears stationary. Second, charges within the rod receive a force QV cross B. However, this moving observer doesn't measure any velocity uh, for the rod because it moves with the rod and hence will interpret this force as an electric force. So this moving observer is an electric field which would produce the same effect. The electric field applies a force Q times E. Now I measure Q V cross B. Therefore, the electric field that this moving observer measures is V cross B. You see those two would actually produce, this field would produce the same force as the force that is measured by the moving observer. And this gives you an alternative way of uh, expressing the EMF due to the motion, this motional EMF, which is V cross B dot DL. So instead of calculating closed path integral of the electric field, Close, we calculate closed path integral of this V cross B. So this is the alternative way of finding EMFs when you have motional EMF. And V is the uh, velocity in the moving segment. So here we had just one moving segment, the rod. If we had many moving segments, then we would apply this. Uh, we would have the uh, velocity for each segment uh, being used in this closed path integral. So this is an equivalent way. This being said, I definitely prefer the first one. I think that this is the most uh, easy to apply. I will demonstrate this one for completeness. So let's see how this would work here. So you see, in the example of the moving rod, the only segment of the circuit that is moving is 2, 3. So all other segments are constant, are stationary, 
one, two, three, four, and uh, four, one are all stationary. The only segment that is moving is V23, which is moving to the right. So then I apply Faraday's law. I keep the same Um, the same um, sense of uh, way of tracing the loop. So this is x, this is y. So you see as I'm running this closed path integral, the only place where I encounter non-zero force is the moving rod. Everything else stays constant and hence This, uh, let me just put the numbers here, integral of uh, V cross B one, uh, four, three, two, one, So as I move from 1 to 4, 4 to 3, 3 to 2, 2 to 1 is actually equal to the integral from 3 to 2, v cross b dot dl. All the other segments do not move, and therefore their velocity is 0. So here I have velocity being v naught x hat, magnetic field being z hat b naught. I'm moving, as you see, along the y-axis. So my dl here is y dy. dy means I'm integrating along the y-axis. And you see, as I'm moving from 3 to 2, my y-coordinate changes from 0 to h. So x cross z is minus y hat. So that uh, minus uh, y dot y gives me a minus 1. I carry it here. And the result is minus v naught b naught h. So you see it's exactly the same as the one I had before. So the EMF here is minus V naught. It's a motional EMF. Let me just put here the subscript minus V naught B naught H. So it is up to you to prefer the first or the second way. They will both give you the same result. OK, any questions on this example? All right, so my second example for this, uh, and or before I get to the second example, let me uh, mention what happens when you have now the combined EF, EMF. So combined means that we have both transformer and motional. So this same example can be used to demonstrate what we mean here. So transformer means that the magnetic field changes, but the circuit remains stationary. Uh, motional means the magnetic field doesn't have to change, but the circuit changes. So now, if we had inside uh, this system magnetic flux that was time varying, then we would have a combined EMF. So we can consider the same example
but now with time varying magnetic field. So let's say we have a cosine soidal magnetic field, cosine omega t. Then what happens? The first method gives you a very straightforward answer right away. So method one, I don't even need to think much about it. I go back to the expression for my flux. And now I realize that all I need to do is replace the magnetic field with with this. So the magnetic flux density has become time varying. So that is now the time varying flux. So now that I uh, take d phi by dt, you see how the mathematics captures the fact that we have now a combined effect because we need to apply the chain rule. We now have time dependence both in the magnetic field and the length of this path. So that will be now this is the first term plus a second term So you see we have from the chain rule the clear separation of the two terms. This one is the transformer EMF. You see that it would be zero, it would be, uh, zero if the magnetic flux didn't change with time. So this is the transformer EMF. And this one is the motional EMF. Because as you see, it would be zero if the rod stops moving. And then we have the EMF being minus d phi by dt. Obviously, the actual EMF has a minus sign in front of it. So minus db over dt x of t times h minus b of t dx dt times h. So we have the motional and the transformer. Let me put it uh, on that final equation. And motional. So you see the chain rule very easily shows you um, which one is which. And now the fact that we have a combined effect. So just to uh, close this example, for this particular example, dx over dt is constant. V0 is the velocity of the rod. Uh, db over dt uh, is the uh, derivative of the cosine, which is minus omega b naught sine omega t. And if you put this back, you will find the final answer for the EMF with its two terms. Uh, that is... Uh, omega b naught sine omega t x h uh, minus b naught cosine omega t uh, times v naught h. So you see now it's uh, somewhat difficult to apply this uh, Lenz's law or understand the current. You have to plot this to see where the current goes. 
since now we have a combined effect of both the variation of the magnetic flux and of the, uh, the motion of the rod. But you see that this method really gives you the answer uh, in a fairly simple way. You just need to express the magnetic flux and then take the derivative. Any questions up to this point? Okay, so then let me do the second method. So the second method plays with this stationary observer and uh, And uh, that stationary observer, obviously, when it uh, moves and sees the circuit as, const as stationary, uh, will see that there is a transformer EMF due to the variation of the magnetic field. So this is the general formula. The uh, moving observer will see this circuit as stationary. Therefore, they can calculate the transformer EMF directly as this integral here. So in other words, the moving observer sees this S of T as stationary, and therefore they can say, for me, the transformer EMF is basically the time-varying flux through a circuit that I take a, a snapshot at a fixed time T, and it appears to be stationary. There is time-varying magnetic flux through it, so therefore, for me, I can take this derivative inside. S is constant, doesn't move. I'm just taking a snapshot of the circuit, uh, just like what you see over there, and I'm applying the formula for the transformer EMF. And as for the motional EMF, I know the formula, and I add it up. That will be V cross B dot DL. So this is the second uh, way, and you see there is a symmetry between the two. That is, this formula basically gives you explicitly how the chain rule that we found there works. So the chain rule physically means that you have one term that is attributed only to the transformer EMF. So even the moving observer sees that, although he sees the uh, circuit is stationary, still there is time varying flux through it. And the only difference between the original formula and the second one is that now the derivative is applied only to the magnetic field and that, that's why it has become now partial. So it's not outside the integral, it goes inside the integral. And then, so this is the transformer part. And this is the motional EMF part, which we showed before. So even a moving observer understands there are those two combined effects. The motional EMF, we know from before how to calculate, and now we have to add the transformer EMF. So how does this work? Uh, it works as follows. So the snapshot of the circuit at time t is this one.
So this circuit has length x of t and height h. And there is this magnetic flux that goes through it. The formula tells me that the transformer EMF will be minus the time rate of change of the magnetic field So the time derivative is applied only to the magnetic field. Sorry, let me only to the magnetic field, not to the circuit. The circuit appears stationary at that moment in time. Z dx dy. I keep the same um, direction of tracing the loop as before. So just keep the same convention. <coughs> so z dot z is one. I have a minus sign. So I have minus theta b over theta t times the area of the loop, which is x of t times h. So I have indeed uh, minus db over dt x of t times h. So you see it's exactly the first term that we got uh, before. And the second term, the motional EMF, we calculated before. We calculated before, so it is this one here. But now I uh, replace uh, B with uh, the B naught that I had before. I replace it with B of T. There is no time derivative and no problem in doing this replacement. So the same thing that I found here, I replace here. So you see, at the end of the day, in a, a little bit more complicated way of reasoning, how this works, I find the same result. So, and again, the, to me, it is um, much easier to do it uh, this way rather than splitting those two terms. But you will see this method in your textbook. So, uh, I covered it anyway for completeness. So same as before. Okay. So in uh, this formula, v naught is dx over dt. So. so the point here is basically that you plug in the time rate of change of the magnetic flux in this integral. You find the flux through this circuit without worrying that it's time varying, and then you find on top the motional EMF. So in the second method, you don't have any uh, time derivatives applied on the area of the loop. The only time derivative that is present in the second method is applied on the magnetic flux, not on the loop. So uh, these are the two methods to handle this effect. So one of the, uh, you see, it seems that uh, this is out of order. So one of the uh, most important applications of this effect is the electromagnetic generator. The topology of the electromagnetic generator we had seen uh, when we were talking about torque in uh, current carrying wires. I had a, a nice animation which uh, I cannot show. So this is uh, a substitute for 
the animation. So we have uh, a frame that is rotating around the x-axis. So this is a rectangular frame. Height H, width W, uh, within a time, uh, uh, a constant magnetic flux. So we have here a magnetic field in the y direction which for now I will consider constant and then I will also show the uh, case when it is time varying. So now this uh, has come back. Let me just show you the animation uh, for this uh, moving frame. You may remember it from the time that we had uh, discussed torques. Uh, so I have uh, here this moving frame inside the uh, magnetic field. That's a constant magnetic field. And um, you see that because of the motion, this frame intercepts time varying magnetic flux. And therefore, I expect to see an electromotive force in fact, uh, you see over there the current lines that have been drawn in the animation that uh, uh, are produced by the battery. But on top of that, on top of the um, current uh, that is produced by the battery, I am expecting to see a current due to the time varying magnetic flux. So I can calculate this current from Faraday's law. And this will be. the next uh, thing to do. So I will use the uh, first method. So if we see this from the side, and that is uh, quite useful, or in fact, not side view, but front view. the cross section on the yz plane. So this is the yz plane. We see this frame moving, rotating around the x axis. So the x axis is coming out of the board. And let's say this is one, two, three, four. <coughs> So this is one, this is four, if you see it from the front. And this angle is theta that changes because of the motion. The magnetic field goes through the loop. The magnetic field lines are in the y direction, like this. And I will apply Faraday's law here, tracing the loop in this sense. So I will trace the loop like this. That gives me a DS that points to the right. Again, from this right hand rule. So in this. Uh, at this instance, my DS will be pointing this way, normal to the loop. OK, so this is my DS. So if I want to express this DS, you see that it has, and maybe I should use a different color, a Y and a Z component.
This side is normal to the z-axis. This side is normal to the loop. So this angle is also theta. So you see this uh, ds vector He has a y component that is cosine theta and a z component minus z, in fact, sine theta. So this is the ds that will help me find the flux through the loop. So the flux through the loop, time varying, is beta ds. The magnetic field is constant, so it is b naught y. My ds has those two components. y cosine theta minus z sine theta. So you see the magnetic flux is actually giving me, uh, so the dot product has these two terms, y dot y and y dot z. So obviously, in this direction, you're not intercepting any magnetic flux. You're intercepting magnetic flux only in this direction. So therefore, this y dot y cosine theta and so on will be cosine theta minus 0. y dot z gives me 0. So I have only a non-zero result out of the first dot product. Again. Uh, you can project this magnetic flux into two directions, one perpendicular to the loop and one parallel to the loop. The one that is parallel to the loop does not induce any magnetic flux whatsoever. So you see this from the dot product. Y dot z is zero, y dot y is one. So you have B naught cosine theta times an integral that l runs throughout the area of the loop and gives you the area, which is w times h. So therefore, I have a time varying magnetic flux b naught cosine theta w times h. Obviously, the only thing that varies here with time is the angle. The magnetic field is constant. W and H are, are constant. The only thing that changes is the angle. So we have B naught WH D over DT of cosine of theta, and theta is theta of T. So this derivative of the cosine is minus sine. Minus sine theta times d theta over dt. So d theta over dt is the angular frequency for this motion in radians per second. Let me call it omega. So Therefore, you see that I have an EMF, which is very different from the voltage of the battery. The voltage of the battery is DC voltage. But now I have a, an EMF that is actually AC EMF. It's alternating. B naught W H omega sine of theta. And I set theta as omega times t. So as a result, I will have this EMF that I can enter 
as a virtual source in this loop with a polarity such that if it was positive, it would drive a current along the loop. So now if I'm interested in this voltage here of the generator, all I need to do is apply Kirchhoff's voltage law Because remember, once you have the EMF in your circuit, then you can apply ordinary circuit laws. So if I'm interested, if someone asks me, tell me what is the V of the generator, I can just go around the loop, minus V EMF plus V is equal to zero. So V is equal to the V EMF and hence here it is minus B naught W H omega sine of omega T. And that is the voltage of the generator. And if I uh, connect this voltage to a resistor, I can find the current and so on and so forth. Okay, so you see that works very easily once uh, you use this uh, uh, first method. And if the magnetic field was time varying, then simply I would put a B of T inside here. And then I would have two terms in that case. So uh, this um, method of expressing the flux and then time the, taking the time derivative works fairly well uh, in this case too. All right. So I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. And um, I'll stick around if there are any questions.